Good morning to you, and uh, whether you're joining us online this morning or in person, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to Greenwich Mean Time, and welcome to Christchurch. I have to say you're looking bright and radiant out there this morning, not that you don't usually, um, but you're looking even better than normal today, it's almost as if you'd taken an extra hour in bed or something. You know, when you get to be as old as I am, some things in life are no longer quite as exciting as they once were. And the twice a year moving of the clocks is one of those things. <clears throat> I can remember one Sunday morning about 40 years ago, cycling to a church in the little village of Duffield to find that it was totally shut up and nobody was around. Couldn't, of course, check your smartphone in those days to see what was going on, they hadn't been invented. And as I was contemplating if I'd somehow missed out on the rapture and I was wondering what to do next, a cheery milkman came by on his rounds. So I asked him the time and I found out it was only actually nine o'clock and realized that as a diligent, mature student absorbed in my studies, I'd completely missed out on all the announcements about the clocks going back. But another year, it was even more exciting to learn that somebody else who had heeded the warnings about the clocks changing, hadn't paid close enough attention to which direction they were changing in, and they ended up <laughs> turning up for church two hours early. Sadly, none of that stuff is, is likely to happen anymore. And if it did, you certainly wouldn't find a cheery milkman to uh, check the time with, I'm afraid. <laughs> I have to report, though, I did raise a mild pulse of excitement this morning in the early hours when I woke very suddenly to this clicking noise and then I realized that the bedside clock was adjusting itself and the minute hand was winding its way round from three o'clock back to two o'clock for 11 hours. These days, of course, we don't even have to be aware the clocks are changing because most of them in our smartphones, they all do it by themselves. So yet another of life's little excitements has been ruthlessly snuffed out at the hands of advancing technology. Or maybe we should say at the digits of advancing technology rather than the hands. <laughs> he liked the joke. I think. <laughs> In his second letter, towards the end of the New Testament part of the Bible, Peter writes these words. He says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And as we come together this morning to worship the one who set the stars and the universe in place, the one who made the heavens and the earth, the one who brought everything into being from nothing and gave his life, for mankind and gave life to all of mankind. He is outside of time constraints, the time constraints in which we are so consumed. Yet God is the one who numbers our days. And he is the one who has given us this day, this day to join together and to praise him. So I'd like you to stand if you're able to do that with us as we bring our songs and as we acknowledge that this is the day that the Lord 
has made and that we will choose to rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Whether the sun will shine, whether its eyes will rain, I know that you are good, this is the day you made. Whether in life or death, whether in joy or pain, I know the truth remains, that this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in Now I can walk in faith, you will protect my way. Your every work is good, this is the day you made. I am a child of yours, you are the one who saves. I am redeemed by love, and this is the day you made. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day come and sing your praise for the lord now reigns on the throne of grace soon is the day he will bring us home and we have this hope for we are his own this is the day come and sing your praise for the lord now reigns on the throne of He will bring us home, and we have this hope, for we are his home. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice as we lift his name. This is the day that the Lord has made. Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in Come and rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in Life 
to your presence we come, we worship you, our precious Savior, fill us, fill us with your holy power, set us aflame with your love, till nations all know. Father, we choose to bring our worship to you, to join all the earth, the skies, the seas, the fields, the trees, in declaring your glory and your great love. You alone are God. Through the sunshine, through the rain, through the joy and the pain, in life and in death, you our sovereign God. And we worship you today and we stand today with those in less fortunate circumstances than we are, in difficult places of this world. And we pray for them and we bring them to you in times of trouble. Father, have mercy on this world, we pray. Have mercy on us. We come to you. We commit ourselves again this day, trusting only in the mercy that you've shown to us through Jesus on the cross. And we come in and through him. We come, offer our lives again this day to follow you and to serve you all the days that you choose to give us here on this earth. And we bring our thanks and our prayers in Jesus precious name. Amen. Amen. Please take a seat and over to Debbie. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So I wonder, um, a slide is going to come up and I wonder if anyone can tell me what story uh, this character is from or who this character is. Yes, that is right, the hungry caterpillar. In fact, the story is called The Very Hungry Caterpillar. And uh, I've got a copy of this uh, book right here, quite the antique version. This was actually mine when I was very tiny. So um, you can come to me later and see if you know how old this book is. Um, but the story goes, doesn't it, that the caterpillar spends all week eating loads and loads of delicious food. And then on the last day, what does the caterpillar eat? Can anyone shout out, what does the caterpillar eat on the last day? Ready? A leaf. A leaf. That's right. So... Um, Actually, if you think about it, this, this very cute little caterpillar is actually an enemy of the plant whose leaf he eats because plants have enemies, whether it's tiny little bugs that eat their leaves or whether it's bigger animals that come along and chomp the whole plant. 
So the plants need to try to defend themselves and protect themselves from their enemies. But how do they do it? Can they block or punch? No, they haven't got any arms. Can they run away? No, because they haven't got any legs. But God has created the plants to be able to protect themselves. He's given them special ways to fight off their enemies. So some plants have thorns or spikes that protect them. Um, Sometimes they have these spines on them and it stops the uh, animals from getting near them, stops humans from getting near them as well. Um, Some of them use chemicals to defend themselves. They make their leaves taste really bitter or really nasty and so sometimes even poisonous actually. So that protects them. But what can we learn from plants this morning? Well, we also have an enemy that we need to defend ourselves from. The devil would love it if we turned our backs on God, if we no longer had hope in Jesus. And he'll try all kinds of ways to make that happen. But just like God has given plants ways to defend themselves against their enemies, God has given us ways to defend ourselves against the devil and his schemes. Who can remember in the book of Ephesians, there's the armor of God. And we've got all these things to defend ourselves. We've got the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shoes of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. And God has promised to fight for us too. We've been thinking about Moses recently in our morning services. And when Moses was leading the Israelites out of Egypt and the Egyptian army were chasing them, Moses reminded the Israelites that God would fight for them. It says in Exodus 14, 14, the Lord will fight for you. God will protect us and he will fight for us. We just need to trust in him. Let's pray together. Dear God, we know that the devil is real and doesn't want us to be friends with you. Thank you for your promise of protection and that you will fight for us and keep us safe from the evil one. Thank you that you have always been there And you will always be there. Amen. Amen. And I'll hand over to Andrew. That's great. Uh, Thank you, uh, Debbie. Um, Let me add my warm welcome to that of Debbie and and Dave as well. If you're a guest with us here today for the first time, a big welcome. My name's Andrew. Uh, I'm the lead pastor of Christchurch, um, and it's a great privilege for us today to be able to welcome um, another Baptist minister, um, Reverend Sue Wally, um, who's going to be preaching to us uh, a little bit later. She's a, a deaf minister, and um, you, don't worry, we will have spoken uh, English interpretation as she preaches a little bit later. We'll get to know her in a little bit, um, but uh, thank you, Sue, for coming um, really appreciate that. Um, and um, um, just for everybody uh, in the church, one thing to remember for next week, all right? Remember, remember, the 5th of November, we're having one service for the whole church here on this site. Uh, if we need to at the start, we'll overflow into the cafe as well. And, of course, it'll be online. It's at 10 o'clock, all right? Now, if you normally attend our Parkway site, that's not a problem because if you get the time wrong, 
then you know you just turn up here at 10 o'clock a bit later but if you regularly come to pear tree it's worth making a note of that in your calendar on your phone right now so you remember 10 o'clock here uh, together we've got a service together because afterwards straight away we'll flow into a special church meeting at 11.15. Uh, During the service, there'll be groups for children and young people, uh, as per normal, and um, just because there'll be more children um, than normal, please do try and arrive a little bit early, uh, 10 to 10, quarter to 10, just to register the children in, in plenty of time with all the queues that are going on. Um, during the special church meeting, we're calling it because um, we are changing our mortgage from the CAF Bank, uh, taking out a loan with the Baptist Union Corporation, and that requires a special church meeting uh, to make that decision. Uh, we've explained it all in the recent church meeting. An email will come out, and uh, we're just waiting on one document from the Baptist Union Corporation to be able to share with you. So hopefully, please pray the document in and everything to be smooth so that we can have the meeting as planned. It's going to be a great service anyway because it's got a very special mission focus where we'll think around the globe and our mission partners uh, around the world and what God is saying uh, to us. So you, you want to be here anyway just for that. So that's next week. Remember, 5th of November, 10 o'clock. Um, you are great at being hospitable if you drive and parking in the NHS spaces. So if you could do that next Sunday, absolutely brilliant. And we'll keep uh, these uh, car parking spaces for the least uh, mobile. That's fantastic. Right, the children and young people are going to head to their groups right uh, now, and we pray for God's blessing upon you as you open his word, as you have fun together, as you listen to what he's saying, and as you pray to him, all right? May God be with you and bless you and keep you. So if you're not sure where to go, you can head to the back and they will direct you um, to the right group and the right age group. Fantastic. Now, in a moment, I'm going to interview Sue, but just before I do that, just turn to somebody near you and say a hello um, and say, do you come here often or something like that? Um, and uh, tell them your name if you haven't done that. Fantastic. That's great. If you'd like to make... <laughs> I love it when some people walk the whole length of the church to say hello to the person next to them. Can we give a warm... a warm Christchurch welcome to uh, Sue, who's going to come up to the front. Uh, if you come on up, Sue, do you want to come on up on the, to the stage? And um, that's great. Fantastic. A warm welcome. There's a few people um, saying a welcome to you. Now, I said you're a colleague of myself and Simon. You're a Baptist minister. Uh, how did you come to be a Baptist minister? Well... So I went to college, three years training. That's how I become... That's a summary. I went to train for three years. Three years. <laughs> yeah, three years training. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but how did, how did God call you? But, yeah, OK, then. <laughs> when Andrew asked me um, to come here and preach on Exodus, I was a little bit disappointed because I wanted to preach on... He wanted me to preach on 15 to 17, but my, my story um, was, was the, to do with Mo Moses and the burning bush, which is in 3 to 4. And so I was disappointed that I couldn't speak on that. So how did God call me? 2018, I was working in mental health in a secure unit um, with deaf mental health patients. I was, was part-time OT and part-time educator. 
management decided on a restructuring, <laughs> as they do. Uh, again, this has happened again and again. And I was questioning, what shall I do? Shall I stay? Um, shall I reapply for my job? A friend who I know really well, it was a lovely day. We were sitting down and have a conversation. I was explaining to her about all my problems that I was having. She wasn't a Christian, but she said to me, what is your passion? Hmm... Neither of those. Hmm. <laughs> so I did some self-analysis, thinking to myself, what is my passion? And my passion is Jesus. And I want deaf people to come to know Jesus and have a relationship with him. So I started thinking, hmm, what am I going to do? Try, I tried different doors. And then suddenly they all started to open. Wow, I had to put a handbrake on that. <laughs> But like Moses, I had an. I was talking to God. Said, oh, "I can't do that. I'm a woman. I haven't been in academia for a while. I'm deaf." But God provided and provided and provided all these different answers to my prayers in a marvelous, marvelous ways. So yeah, I think that answers your question, Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that's good. So I, I love the passion for Jesus and uh, your desire to share Jesus with others. Um, what, what's your vision for ministry? Okay then. Well, first I have to say, we all know John 3, 16, don't we? It says, God so loved the world. That means he loves everybody doesn't put people into different groups say, oh, you're, you're left out, you're marginalised in some way. No, it says all. Hebrews, Christians, male, female, deaf, hearing, he loves everybody and it's, the invitation is to everybody. Everyone is included in that invitation. And also 1 Corinthians 12, 27 We're all the body of Christ, and we're all included in that, every single one of us. And my vision is for a church to be completely welcoming, fully welcoming, and fully inclusive. And I also wanted to empower deaf people. And we all have a responsibility and a duty in that. We all have gifts. We all have gifts. And people shouldn't be put to one side, but everybody has a gift. Deaf and hearing, everyone has a, has a gift. And many people think that deaf people, are to, we do missionary to the deaf community, to help the deaf community. But the deaf community has lots of gifts that they can give and share with, with the hearing community. I want people to see that, that deaf people can be in mission as well and can be in ministry. So I've set up a monthly BSL Deaf Cafe. And that's really, that's like a deaf, safe deaf space for deaf people to come along, talk together in sign language, have coffee and cake as well. And also pray. People come along and spend time with prayer with each other. And we've been thinking about well, well-being, people's well-being as well. We've had last month we had chair exercises, and soon we're going to have a BSL 999 talk, to, so people um, can look after themselves. They can contact emergency services themselves. And it's also a space for deaf Christians to practice ministry, it's to talk to other deaf people and teach them about Jesus. Yeah, now that's a brilliant vision. Um, and uh, just um, and I like the sign for cake, so that's good. Yeah, um, that's that's great. Um, just uh, one question people often ask is, how do deaf people hear God speak to them? Do, uh, does He speak to them in the same way or similar ways to hearing people? The short answer is yes. 
But there is a longer answer, which I'll give to you. So for some deaf people, English isn't their first language. British Sign Language is their first language. So it's sometimes it's difficult for them access, to access um, the Bible and also perhaps some preaches. They, don't un they wouldn't be able to understand them without BSL interpretation. Yes, he can speak through dreams and songs and texts, but he always needs to be translated. For hearing people, you know, it needs to be translated for deaf people to make sure they can fully understand it. There is the BSL Bible Translation Project. Um, you can have a look online if you Google that. And we have wonderful errands, like I have with me today, <laughs> who are supporting me. That's brilliant, and uh, those things are, are really important, and uh, yes, so like Aaron was to Moses, you have others working alongside you, so that's brilliant, yeah, and we're really grateful. Um, just, why does it help having a, a deaf ministry and a deaf ministry leader? What, what difference can it make? Oh, whatever, in churches at church also, but it's so important to have deaf leaders as well. And the reason for that is missionaries go to different countries, don't they? Um, and, you know, but they'll accept somebody who knows them well, who knows their culture and their language, or, you know, both on a par with one another. So it's important that deaf people to have that. They have deaf role models um, to explain to them about the Christian Christian life, etc., so they can follow what the what the we do have some trained and some not trained um, deaf ministers, um, but we don't have any leaders. But but we think, we think of John three sixteen. We, we do go out and meet people um, to try and support people as much as we can um, so that they can access the Bible and then meet with God that way. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're really um, delighted to have you with us. And um, it turns it around the other way today um, because those uh, in our deaf ministry will be able to have the the, the sermon direct, <laughs> and we will be relying on the translation for once. So uh, a real joy for us. Is it possible, we'd love to pray for you, uh, Sue, in your ministry, um, and um, I know we had a service at our other site, uh, Parkway, earlier, and we pray for you there, but it, this is like what we call a double blessing of God upon <laughs> you. Is that all right? So, and there are people watching and sharing online, so they'll be praying for you too. So let's just pray for you within your ministry area. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Sue. Thank you that you've called her. Thank you that you've opened doors Thank you that you didn't listen to her excuses, but uh, yeah. drew her into ministry. Now, Lord, we pray, fill her afresh with the Holy Spirit, and each day fill her anew. And uh, we pray you fill her heart with your compassion and your love, that you would fill her mind with understanding and insight. And we pray that you would light her way as she seeks to serve you in the deaf community and in the hearing community as well. Bless her and her heart's desire that people, deaf and hearing people, might meet Jesus and come to know him. Bless her. May she have the joy of seeing that many, many times, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's great. Thank you. That's brilliant. I'm going to hand back to Dave and the band. They're going to lead us in some sung worship. And, um, and then Alison's going to come and read today's passage uh, for us. So.
be high. Jesus, it's you we glorify. Your name be lifted high. Jesus, be lifted high. Wherever your people gather in your name, whether hidden or in freedom as we are, Jesus, be lifted high in the gathering of your people this day. Father, be lifted high in this place. For children, young people right now meeting, be lifted high, Jesus. Move powerfully among them, we pray. Father, be lifted high in this community in which we live. Be lifted high in this town. Be lifted high through this church. Father, we're offering these gifts today and those that come week by week, month by month through the bank account to the church. Father, thank you that you have blessed this church. And Father, we offer back to you these gifts and all the gifts that you've given that Jesus may be high and lifted up in this community in which we live. Jesus, be high and lifted up through your word in this place today, through the reading of your word as Alison comes to us now and through Sue as she shares your word together with us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible reading is taken from Exodus 15, verses 22 to 27. Moses led Israel away from the Red Sea into the desert of Shur. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding water. When they came to Marah, they couldn't drink the water because it tasted bitter. That's why the place was called Mara, means bitter place. The people complained about Moses, asking, 
What are we supposed to drink? Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord set down laws and rules for them to live by, and there he tested them. He said, If you will listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what he considers right, if you pay attention to his commands and obey all his laws, I will never make you suffer any of the diseases I made the Egyptians suffer, because I am the Lord who heals you. Next, they went to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees. They camped there by the water. Just bear with me, sorry. It's the deaf way. I need space. Um, plus, I'm very clumsy um, <laughs> with things. <laughs> um, just imagine me just moving things. And me and my husband with a nice flower tree moving things out of the way. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, firstly, I would just like to say thank you so much to all of you for inviting me to come here this morning. It's a pleasure to be here and to see all of you So last week, I know that there was a preaching on Exodus chapter 14, which was talking about the parting of the Red Sea and God's call to rescuing the, Egyptian, the Israelites. Now, the Bible text that was given me today is quite long, um, two chapters, but don't worry, I'm not covering all of that today. We're just going to focus on Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 to 27, the reading that Alison just read. Now, prior to that, there was the miraculous parting of the Red Sea. Moses and Miriam, and there was a song of praise to the Lord. He'd saved them from the Egyptians. So we start this by thinking about the celebratory um, rescue. They're all happy, they, they've just been rescued. Now, was that joy continued? No, it was cut short. Now, if we look at this map, we can see the route that the Israelites had taken. So it's quite long. Now, I wanted us to think about the wilderness and how they were going to survive going through that wilderness but also pondering about how we're going to trust God through that wilderness. So they're going through, we're going to go through this verse by verse. And we're going through a specific translation. So if we have a look at the verse, the first verse, verse 22. Now Moses led Israel away from the Red Sea into the desert of Shur. For three days they travelled in the desert without finding any water. So just imagine, you get ready, you go off, you go for your trek for three days, and you've got no water. Now, they don't sound very prepared, do they? Now imagine you go and you get your flasks, everyone's got their little water bottles, but back then they didn't have anything. So they must have been mental. <laughs> Think about that challenge that they're going through. Wandering off, trekking for three days, they must have been gasping and so thirsty. Now I did a quick Google search to see how long you can survive without any water. And it's roughly three days, about three days without any water. But also you can survive without food for about three weeks. 
it's depending on the situation, of course. Now, I also saw a story about an Austrian bricklayer. Now, his name was Andreas Mihovic. Might have that pronunciation wrong, but there you go. Um, <laughs> now, he was in prison, and he didn't have... He was left there for 18 days with no water. 18 days, wow, can you imagine that? And you know why? The police totally forgot about him. Awful. And I was thinking how you'd go through 18 days without any water, let alone three. So maybe you might have watched a program on the TV um, called SAS, Who Dares Wins. Anybody watch that? The big cop oh, yeah, I see a few hands going up. Fantastic, wonderful. Now, I've not watched all of them, just a few. <laughs> but they're very competitive, and it's amazing, the challenges and the situations they have to go through. Um, and obviously, before that, they've gone to the gym, they've done all sorts, they're very prepared, and they know the struggles that they're going to go through. But compared to the Hebrews, who hadn't done any training, no preparation, and off they went on their trek. So we're going to see how they go through and how they survive. And the stages that they go through. I mean, poor Andreas, he'd been forgotten about. And he was just there. But God didn't forget about the Hebrews. He was with them. He was actually encouraging through their journey. Completely different. Now the Hebrews in the first part of their journey, how did they survive? Moses was leading them. And they, he had faith and trust. And that was really good. And they followed Moses. They were like, yeah, we're going to follow Moses. Now in verse 23, they'd arrived at Marah. So when they came to Marah, they couldn't drink the water because it tasted bitter. That's why the place was called Marah, bitter place. So after three days, you've got to think, they hadn't had any water. They get to this place where they see water, and they're like, wow, let's leg it. They jump down, they scoop the water up, taste it, and they're like, ugh, <laughs> Disgusting. There's joy and relief at finding this water changed to disappointment and frustration. The Hebrews then started to, oh, Moses, look at him. So they start muttering. <laughs> How, I don't know if you've read a book, and this book's called A Way Through the Wilderness. The person who wrote it is Jamie Buckingham. Has anybody read it? Anyone? Oh, we've got, we've got one person over here. Well done. Now, I haven't read it all the way through. Have you read it all the way through? Ah, oh, well, a long time ago. Okay, fantastic. Well done. Is it any good? Yeah, fantastic. Got a recommendation over here. Well, well done. <laughs> now, the author himself has said that inside the water is magnesium. Hmm, magnesium. I don't know if any of you know, but magnesium is a powerful <laughs> laxative. <laughs> Just to let you know. So, <laughs> imagine <laughs> um, all the germs and bugs and everything that you take in, um, that you carry away for you on the journey, would have been wiped out and cleansed. Hmm, yeah, so God's looking after them. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. And also, just to let you know, magnesium, um, it's got a drug in it called dolomite. And anybody know about dolomite? I don't know. It, that drug is used by athletes. So when they go for training and so on in very hot countries um, and difficult areas, that drug is actually helping their heart to beat well and beat in a regular rhythm. So, and it also helps their muscles if they get stiff. 
So a bit of um, knowledge for you. So that water could have been similar. It's like medicine, a bitter medicine. That's why it tasted bitter. Maybe you remember when you were a child and your parents said, come on, take your medicine, it's good for you, drink it up. It's a bit like that. So it could be like that. Maybe that's why the water tasted bitter. Although it was bitter, it's very helpful. But God wants a relationship with us. He wants a relationship with the Hebrews. And they drank that water and were like, ugh, I can't drink that. And what did they do? Hey, this is a problem, God. We need some help. Is that what they did? No. Oh, they'd been through the Red Sea. They'd seen this miracle. They'd been rescued. God can help them, can't he? But that's not what they saw. They didn't trust him. In verse, let me get my glasses on, verse 24, the people complained about Moses by asking, what are we supposed to drink? As soon as something went wrong, the people complained to Moses, their leader. We blame the leader, don't we? Where's Moses? Where is he? Come here. Complain, complain, complain. Oi, you. We blame people, don't we, when something goes wrong. We put the blame out. We look for something or someone to blame. Maybe we blame the government or the council. Maybe we blame a family member. Or maybe we blame the service provider. We'll look for something to blame. We complain. <coughs> Poor Moses. He became the complaints administrator. Oh, poor Moses. Everyone was complaining at him. Was it his fault? Of course it wasn't. But somebody had to get it, get it in the neck. But he followed God. But God wants us to look to him. He wants us to pray to him. But the Hebrews were too busy complaining. There's a problem, there's a problem, there's a problem. Moan, moan, moan. The Hebrews needed to survive. But they were too busy looking at things, looking at the problem, looking at each other rather than looking at God. And they missed what God wanted to say to them. In verse 25, Moses cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a piece of wood. He threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord set down laws and rules for them to live by, and there he tested them. <clears throat> The Hebrews themselves gave everything over to Moses. They just complained, but Moses took it upon himself to ask the Lord for help. I've been thinking about this, mulling it over. What do we do? Do we ask other people to pray for us? Do we say, oh, please pray for me. Can you pray for me? Can you over there pray for me? That's fine, don't get me wrong, that's absolutely fine. It's not wrong in itself. I was thinking, I had a friend who had a really, really bad back and for weeks she went to church, she asked others to pray for her. She went to healing services. And one evening, she actually felt the Lord saying, why I want you to ask me, you pray for the healing. And she went, oh, <laughs> okay. God, can you heal me? And do you know what? She was healed. She'd been going for weeks and weeks through suffering with a bad back. And until she prayed herself, it wasn't until then she was healed. 
we can depend on so many other people for them to pray for us, but we should be doing that ourselves. We need to rely on him. And also with the Hebrews, they were just waiting and waiting, and God was waiting for them to come to him. Because he wants to have a relationship with them. He wanted the Hebrews to have a relationship with him, and he wants us to have a relationship with him. Relationship is what? Communication. He wants us to have that communication with him. He wants us to have that trust with him. He's a good, good father, right? He's a good, good father. But he doesn't want us to just be getting things for him. He doesn't want us to just dole things out without getting a response. It's about communicating. If he just doles things out, how are we going to have faith? The second part of the verse where God gives the laws and the rules and then tests them. If you read it, you feel like back in the day when you were at school, don't you? Where you get all that teaching. Come on, learn it, and now I'm going to test you. But learning's difficult, and it's important that we understand what we've learned. And we need testing sometimes to check that we've actually absorbed all that learning that we've understood what we've learned. If we, have you, who's got an instruction manual at home? I'm sure you've got loads, there's thick, massive books. And what do you do with them? Do you just put them in a drawer, stick them in a cupboard? Or do you actually read them? Or do you just flick through to the important bits when you and think, oh, right, yeah, got that, got that, that's fine. Or do you leave them in the cupboard and then when something breaks, you're like, oh my gosh, where's that, inter or that instruction manual? How do I fix it? And I'm thinking, we've all got Bibles, or most of us have got a Bible. How do we treat the Bible? Do you just take it out at Christmas and Easter? Or do you take it out when you need it, when you've got a problem? Or do we read them regularly? Do we read them every day? Now, Moses kept his eyes on the Lord, and he asked the Lord for help. We need to be the same. When we've got issues, do we just go to the Lord? It's not like a tree, like a problem solver. We've got our Bible with us all the time. We have to be praying all the time, reading our Bibles all the time. God will provide for us, and we can go to him at all times. If we look at verse 26, it says, he said, if you will listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what he considers right, if you pay attention to his commands and obey all his lords, I will never make you suffer any of the diseases I made the Egyptians suffer because I am the Lord who heals you. The laws, the commands, the instructions he gives most of us need to know and follow them. And the reason is because if we fail to follow them, there's issues that will happen. Our parents teach us and they teach our children how to behave. There's a reason, because if something happens, there's going to be a problem. I don't know if um, I, the chapter 16, there's a bit about manna. And it teaches us how to understand the laws and what we need to focus on to listen to God. The Hebrews have been told the laws and the instructions on what to follow and how to obey God so that they don't get any illnesses. Now, most of us have illnesses, don't we? You have illnesses, we have problems. But what does it say here? What does it really say here? Not to ignore don't ignore God. And that's a, sim that's a tip. Don't ignore God. Now, I know it's easy for us when we, um, or not, it's difficult to actually go through and understand the laws and what happens if we don't. It's hard really to trust and follow God 
Because we're just like, oh, I can't bother it, I'm not doing this. It's hard. But God knows a bigger picture of our lives already, and we don't. We can't just peek around the window and think, all right, I know it's going to be fine, I don't have to trust God. We don't know what's going to happen, we don't know what's around the corner. Have we all been let down? Have you been let down? Do we feel that we can't trust God? Because it is safe to trust God. Aaron trusted God. Ruth trusted God. Sorry, Abraham trusted God. Ruth trusted God. There's the Bible's full of stories of those who trusted God. And obviously, there's loads of stories of people who doubted God. It's all there. But God can be trusted. And you can trust God. We've all got doubts, but I would tell you, read through your Bible, because the stories are there. If we look at verse 27, when they went to Elim. Next, they went to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees. They camped there by the water. So they'd been to Marah, they'd got the laws, and now they've gone to Elim, where there's 12 springs. Imagine, the 12 springs represent the 12 tribes of Israel. Wonderful. And also, there's 70 palm trees. Now, 70 is a really important number in the Bible, but I haven't got time to go through that today. That's going to be for another time. But what we need to know, that God provides more than we need. And it's, honestly, sometimes it's really difficult to trust God when we're going through the easy times. But... We can trust him through easy and difficult times. Um, God's in control. And this is what this passage shows us. We can give everything to him and he will provide. It's really interesting from the water where they've gone to where there, the water was bitter and it was like, ugh. And then... They've gone to somewhere where there's plenty of water. God's guiding them through so many cycles and he helps us through absolutely everything. Throughout this whole passage, well, the two chapters that are broken down, God is there. He does test us and he makes us sure that he's there through any situation without complaining. <laughs> There's some people that will say, what are you praying for? You don't need to pray. If you pray, you're weak. There's a person called Philip Ryken. Um, he's an American theologist. And he says it's not a sin to bring God our problems. He invites us to talk things over with him through prayer. What is a sin, however is to have a complaining spirit that poisons our communion with Christ and thus robs us of the joy of serving God. No one likes to hear somebody that's complaining and complaining and complaining all the time. Do you like someone complaining at you all the time? No, and I don't think God likes it either. God wants us to trust him. He wants your faith to grow. Um, sometimes when life is good, it's great, but we do have difficult times. But let's pray. Let's pray that God helps us and has faith in him to grow strong. Ask God to help us to fix our eyes on him and get the problem away. Just fix our eyes on him and not the problem. Help us to have faith and in other people. And not that when things happen that we're going, God, what's this? Have faith to be strong in him and not the problems. Some people think, oh, Lord, what's all this suffering going on? But we can't learn without some issues and without some suffering. Some of you know the story, the children's story, Let's go on a bear hunt. Do you know that story? Um, the children are going out looking for an imaginary bear and they have to catch it. 
and they're going through lots of obstacles and lots of different things. Now, there's a phrase there that pops out at me. Can't go over it, can't go under it, but you have to go through it. You just have to. So if you want to have strong faith in God, we're going to have to go through it no matter what. We really do. So I feel like it sounds like, oh, sometimes you think God just doesn't care if we suffer. You might feel like that, but believe me, that is really not true. God cares about you so, so much. He just wants us to learn the teaching. Sometimes we fail to understand that suffering is just a process to help us to grow and be prepared for the future because there's always going to be something. And when we look back, we're like, wow, God's been working. God's been there all the time. So just to sum up, let's focus on God. He's there. He's always there. Philippians 4.8 says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. God is there. Don't forget about those things. Remember them. Also, again, Philippians says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. He wants to be there for you. And lastly, pray continually in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests. Nothing is too big or small. And that's how you'll get through all your issues and problems. Amen. Thank you. The musicians are going to come up as we take a moment to, to respond. Um, that was very powerful, Sue, and uh, I had that sense where you say you can't go under it, you can't go around it, but you need to go through it. And you might think, I'm in the middle of that right now. And now as we respond is a chance for you to say to God, I'm looking to you, I'm coming to you, and you can talk to him. He loves you like a shepherd cares for a whole flock he loves you and he will lead you that's his promise and he will sustain you so if that's you let's stand shall we and we're, we're going to sing um, a song which gives us a chance to say and I will trust I will trust in you alone Jesus is the good shepherd and it's him we can trust so let's make this our response to him to come to him
his goodness never changes and he's with us and life happens around us but his goodness will lead you home and that's something you take hold of now he just calls us to seek him and to trust in him we we have our prayer ministry team here uh, to your left and my right at the front they would love to pray for you whichever part of the journey it is for you it's a touch of healing if there's something an uncertainty coming up and you'd like somebody to pray alongside you in the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit then come as we finish just make your way to the front they'd love to pray with you um, I'm going to say it on behalf of everybody here, but a very big thank you to uh, all three who've come to minister God's word to us this morning. We are very appreciative. Thank you so much. We have heard him speak. Now for you, be confident for he will guide you along the right path for his name's sake. Along the journey, he will bring you to places where you can lie down in green pastures, where there are quiet waters and the waters that refresh you. You need fear no evil, for the Lord is with you, even though you go through the darkest valley. Thank you, Lord that your goodness and love will follow each of us all the days of our lives and we can dwell, live in your house with you. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon each one of us and remain with each one this day and always. Amen. 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 It's been great to share online and with those people gathered here today. As I say, if you're a guest here, please do stay for uh, coffee and for tea. Uh, We'd love to be able to chat uh, with you. And don't forget the opportunity to receive prayer. Thank you.